Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's 2022 Calm Tax Cover a Convo by Business Depot. It's always hard to get those words out. The Business Depot Calm Convo webinar series started around two years ago as we went into lockdown when COVID-19 kicked off. And it was a way for us to keep in contact with the community as we are those accountants who like to talk to our clients as often as humanly possible. And although we're out and about and back and meeting with you in person again, we've had such great feedback over our webinar series, we've decided to keep them going. And along with what, what they didn't teach you in school series, we're making sure we're staying connected to you in an efficient and timely way around everything that's happening in the community and your business environment. Now, the best part about our webinars is the interaction we get from you. So please don't hesitate to ask any of your tax planning questions today. Um, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen as opposed to the chat. That way we can keep track of your questions. And if we don't get to you today, we will follow you up in the next couple of days with answers to your queries. For those of you who have joined us before, you would be used to John Knight, Managing Director and Founder of Business Depot, hosting this series. However, today I have the great privilege of uh, being John. However, my name is Rebecca Mahali. For those of you who have not met me, I am a Director at Business Depot and head up the Sydney operations. I am an accountant by background and a total numbers nerd. I'm joined today by Jackie Reeves, who is our Head of Tax at Business Depot, and Craig Harrison, who's also a Director at Business Depot, and our local real estate guru. Thanks for joining today, guys. Thanks, Rebecca. Good to see you. As you all know, today's topic is tax planning. And as I can see, um, our guests rolling in, we'll get started shortly. Today, we're going to address our key items you should be considering in the lead up to 30 June. 30 June is a fine line that's drawn at the end of the financial year, and we have a short period of time between now and that date to enact items that will put you in the best tax situation. It's really important to understand what needs to fall in this year and what should fall in next year, which are the items that we will cover. Before we quick, excuse me, before we kick off, a quick reminder that everything we discussed today is generic in nature. If you need specific tax planning advice for your business or for your own personal circumstances, please reach out to us. If you're a current client of Business Depot, just reach out to your, cl your client manager. And if you're new to Business Depot, please head over to our website, businessdepot.com.au. Use the contact us details and someone from the team will be in contact as soon as possible. So now we're going to kick off and start with Jackie. Jackie, you and I and Simone Murad, one of the other directors at Business Depot, ran a really exciting and fun uh, budget wrap up a couple of months ago. And we touched on some items that the government had announced may or may not come in for this financial year. Could you give us a quick wrap up of the items that are going to happen and those that have been shelved maybe permanently? Yeah, so um, I guess um, first comments is, wasn't it fun that we got to spend a massive big night doing a budget wrap and then um, a lot of that isn't actually going to come into law. So, and um, I look forward to that. We'll probably be doing another one in a couple of months when Labor will be handing down their um, first budget. <laughs> um, but most of you may or may not be aware, there were a couple of measures that did get passed before we went into caretaker mode and the government went into, and we went into election mode. Um, so some of the things that did get um, approved were the fuel excise, we're all aware of that, that's been highly publicised, um, the ability to vary your um, GDP uplift factor on your pay-as-you-go tax instalments, um, the 250 cost of living payment um, and that low and middle income offset, which isn't going to continue after 30 June 2022. Um, so that's the offset where you'll get up to um, $1,500 tax offset if you're between 48 and 90,000 and then it phases out between 90 and 126,000 in income. Um, a couple of the other measures that got through was the deductibility for COVID-19 tests. Um, so they've made, um, they've legislated that now where you're providing COVID tests, um, the rapid antigen tests for your employees where they need to travel for work or they need to attend the office site for work that they won't be subject to fringe benefits tax um, and they are actually also deductible for individuals. Um, I think there's going to be a little bit of caution around, um, around this measure because, um, you know, you do need to keep a receipt 
Um, you can't be claiming it if you were using it for overseas travel or private holidays and all of those normal rules around deductibility. So I wouldn't just be throwing in, you know, hundreds of dollars of, you know, rapid tests in your tax return if you weren't using them legitimately for work purpose would just be my caution there. Um, <clears throat> now, some of the measures that didn't actually get um, passed before we went into caretaker mode um, I have actually had a number of clients talk to me about this measure after the budget because they were quite excited about it. Um, and I know the caution that I had back then was, is, look, it hasn't been passed, we're in caretaker mode, depending on the election will depend on whether these measures will, will proceed. Um, and that is the 120% deduction for um, investment boosting in skills and training and digital adoption. Um, so this, that was where you could get um, up to 120% deduction if you had spent money on those um, expenses. Now, those ex that deduction was always only going to be applicable in the FY23 financial year. So you could have paid the expenses in FY22, but you were actually going to get that benefit in FY23. Now, because that bill hasn't passed, um, and we're not sure whether the Labor government is going to um, pursue that measure. Um, I think the, the, the messaging there is don't rush out and spend the expense if you weren't going to anyway, which I guess around all of our tax planning conversations is, is that, you know, don't just spend the money to get a tax deduction anyway, but that's a, probably just an additional portion for that measure. Um, you might remember some of the patent box, cha box changes. They haven't progressed either. And again, I'm sure if the current government will be progressing that measure either. Um, so I guess that I'll close out with the message that um, stay tuned for another budget update from Rebecca and I in, in a few months um, to, to see what the, the next government delivers in, its, delivers in its budget. Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, and Craig... <coughs> Tax planning is all about the time management of expenses realistically because we don't encourage our clients usually to spend money unless they actually need to. Can you talk us through the key items where timing can make all the difference in the lead up to 30 June? Yeah, sure. And, and you're right. Look, whenever we're talking to someone about spending money, you still need to have a commercial basis for spending it because otherwise you're spending a dollar for at the absolute most getting 47 cents in the dollar back. And for me, that's 53 cents out of your pocket, so don't spend a dollar just for a tax deduction. Um, and, and very much it is about timing now. Um, and the thing that I talk with my clients about most of all is making sure we've got good matching of expenses to your revenue generation because, as you mentioned before, 30 to June, it's a hard day. So if you're not matching your revenue and your expenses, you may have a period of time where pre-30 to June you're getting a large amount of income in but the expenses that you are going to incur to generate that income are not coming through until the following financial year. So, so some of the things we, we talk to our clients about there is, is making sure that you know, where you are going to earn something and going to be committed to paying something in relation to that income is, is getting invoice for those services where you can, looking for things like prepayments that you can pay, whether that's rent, other things like that, so that you can bring forward your tax deduction as opposed to waiting for it for the next year. It really is a timing difference. The, the reality is tax rates aren't changing over the next financial year. So spending it now isn't going to save you real dollars in tax. It just brings forward the tax deduction. Some of the bigger ticket items that, that I, I deal with are, are people talking about bonuses and, um, and particularly for, for my real estate clients, commissions that they're paying to their, to their sales agents. And it's important to, to know that when you're paying bonuses, for example, to, to team members, then you need to be definitely committed to, to paying those. And that needs to you know, have been calculated, needs to have been notified to the, to the staff member who's getting the bonus pre 30th of June that this bonus will be payable before you've got a, a real ability to accrue it. Um, slightly different for our real estate clients, they, um, they have commission only sales agents and typically written into their employment contracts is a, is a fixed methodology for being paid on commission revenue that's generated. So if a, if a property settles pre 30th of June and the agency gets paid their, the, the commission, um, there will be a fixed amount of that commission they're obliged to pay to the sales agent out of there. And so you've, you've got a real linking of, of revenue and expense that goes through there. So, so looking to make sure that that revenue that's going to come in, you, you understand what expenses you're going to have to, to pay on that 
and, and get the deduction for it this year rather than pushing it out another another 12 months. Um, and, you know, a part of it, I'll probably throw to you here, Jackie, on this, but, you know, when some people are taking deposits for income prior, or for, for a project that may be about to be entered into that's, that's going to span multiple financial years, may not kick off until after 30th of June, and there's a, there's a few little differences in how that's treated in terms of revenue recognition there. Yeah, that's right, Craig. So um, I guess we sort of use some some specific principles in determining whether um, unearned, like say you've had someone prepay you for some work um, and that revenue is unearned um, as to whether you're assessable on it. So I think the key thing there is, is that if the project doesn't go ahead, like maybe it's a deposit for goods or services um, or you've got an upfront fee built into your contract, um, if any portion of that or all of it is refundable, if you don't deliver or you don't deliver by specific times and that's written into your contract, then um, it's actually only earned as income once you deliver on those milestones. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just making sure, um, you know, you have a look at your contracts. Um, if it's not refundable, then you're going to be assessed on it up front. Thanks for that, Jackie. That makes sense. The devil's always in the detail with these items. Now, we've been talking about temporary full expensing deduct deductions and instant asset write-off claims in every one of these webinars I think we've done, but things have changed over the last little bit and we have these questions come up all the time. Jackie, can you go through what the current thresholds and rules are in rega regards to depreciation assets? Yeah, so if you're a regular visit to our conversations, you will know that the temporary full expense thing um, was a measure introduced as part of the COVID relief package. Um, and it did, um, you know, it has sort of adapted over the time and it did get extended to the finishing date for temporary full expensing is 30 June 2023. Um, so I think the key reminder is there is that you don't have to rush out pre 30 June to buy all of your capital assets to get the production particularly if cash flow is tough and you need funds for working capital, um, but you still do have to 30 June 2023. Um, and as Craig mentioned, we don't have that difference in, in tax rates, so it is only a timing benefit. But just, just a reminder, that is the end date now with, um, with no look to extend that at, at this point. Um, now, a reminder that um, temporary full expensing applies for your capital assets if you have an aggregated turnover of less than $5 billion. So pretty much everyone except you, you really big corporates and international groups. Um, for our SME market, though, the key there is, is that if your turnover is less than $50 million, you can actually get temporary full expensing on secondhand assets. Um, Probably not as important this year, but in FY21, you could have written off the balance of your pool. So presumably now that everyone's small business pools are gone um, under the full temporary expensing, there is really probably no pool for FY22 or FY23. You're just getting an instant deduction for, um, for those eligible assets. Um, now, a reminder for eligible assets is, is that it is, um, you know, things like your plant and equipment, um, motor vehicles, all of those sort of depreciating assets, if it is building works or capital works or improvements to those types of assets, um, but they're not actually in the in the depreciation rules um, and are actually a separate rule. So just, just a reminder of that because we do get questions around that about if, you know, um, you know, I build a new building or I do improvements to a building as to whether I'm going to get temporary full expensing. Um, the other key reminder is, is that the asset needs to be installed ready for use prior to 30 June for you to get temporary full expensing. Um, so a key one on that is if you're trying to get a new vehicle before 30 June, you know, given the car market at the moment um, and the availability of stock, it's probably already too late. So that's probably my key reminder there. Thanks, Jackie. Craig, you've actually seen the other side of these measures with clients that have looked to upgrade their vehicles recently. When they're available, I'm trying to get a car, I can't get one. Um, can you talk us through your concerns here? Yeah, look, I think it's one of the, the things, and it's, it's not a concern, it's, it's more about just being aware, is that that um, people have you know, bought a vehicle in the last couple of years, happy days, we get to write up to the luxury car limit of a vehicle off in one go. And as the, the market for secondhand cars has held up and values have held up really well, people that are now changing over are, are finding the other side of that. They're thinking, I'm going to buy a car. I will ride up to the luxury car limit off immediately. 
what they're sometimes forgetting is that on the trade-in, they're, they're going to receive some funds for that and they've got no tax cost base on that vehicle anymore. It's all been written off. So what we are probably seeing is a few clients that are in the in the first instance are thinking, great, I'm going to get another 50-odd thousand dollars deduction on changing over my motor, motor vehicle. The other side of it is you're likely to get a, a fairly significant balancing adjustment on disposal of a vehicle and, and in some cases if that's a luxury car um, as well you're you're getting assessed for more on the changeover than what you're getting as an immediate deduction on on the initial acquisition so um, and there's GST impacts on that as well so it's sort of it's you get the full benefit the first time around but it can come back on you a little bit on you know second or and subsequent acquisitions if if you are trading in Thanks for that, Craig. Now, some of this um, accelerated depreciation, along with a general decline in business trading for some of the businesses across Australia in the last few years, prompted the government to bring out some loss carry back measures. Jackie, can you talk us through where we're at with them and how um, taxpayers can continue to utilise the loss carry back measures for the 2022 year? Yeah, so um, the loss carryback rules tied quite nicely, and that was the policy intent of them, was to tie nicely with the temporary full expensing rules. Um, so they, again, introduced that as part of their COVID relief package, um, and the timing of it is to mirror the temporary full expensing um, with you know, the objective that the government wanted to encourage a lot of businesses, companies to go out, um, invest in, in capital assets, get your temporary full expensing. Yes, that may result in a tax loss for the year, but if you had profits in your prior years is that you can actually carry that loss back um, and get a tax offset um, equal to the amount of tax that you paid in the board with your current tax rate. There are some complex rules because, as we'll know, for companies in the last few years, we've been coming backwards from a 27.5% to 26% to 25% tax rate. So you will get an offset in FY22 equal to 25% or 30% if your turnover is greater than $50 million. Um, but basically, yeah, if you have a loss in FY22, um, you can carry it back to um, FY21 or 20 or 19 if you have had taxable profit in that um, in those years. Now, there are a couple of exceptions there as it's obviously limited to your tax rate now, um, it's limited to your losses and it's limited to the balance of your franking account. So you can't go into a franking deficit to get... Um, to get a refund of those of those offsets. So I think that's the important thing. And obviously only applicable to companies because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a um, yeah, it was only applicable to companies. Thanks, Jackie. We've actually just had a question from Steve in regards to this webinar. The webinar will be recorded and it will be available on our blog after we're done at businessdepot.com.au. I will remind you again at the end of the webinar though. Um, now we're going to move on to a couple of our less COVID related measures um, in regards to our tax planning strategies. Craig, we often tell our clients to have a look at their bad debts um, and assess them in the lead up to the end of June. What is it that our clients should be doing at this time? Well, it is having a close look at them. Um, that's the first step. But you need to take some definite action on those on those bad debts and, and formally resolve that that you're not going to get them. You write them off. Um, effectively, you're taking them out of your age receivables uh, ledger. You are taking um, an actual decision that these are no longer recoverable. A, a mere provision you don't think you're going to get that bad debt is not enough from, from a tax perspective to write that off. If you write it off this year, then obviously you get the deduction. If you formally write it off this year, you obviously get the deduction this year for, for writing off that bad debt. It doesn't mean that it can't be paid in the future if, if circumstances um, genuinely change. It then comes back in as accessible income when you receive it. That is that is important to note. Um, but it does need some definite um, decisions to be made that this is no longer a debt that we are and we're going to recover. Stop chasing. It's a bad debt. It's gone. I imagine there might be some businesses out there that have to have a lot closer look at that this year after the last couple of years that we've been through. Uh, one of the other items we normally talk about at this time of year is superannuation and making sure that all of our business clients and individual clients get the maximum benefit that they can afford out of this. Jackie, can you talk us through what's available this year and upcoming changes to superannuation? 
Sure. Um, so I think if we're talking about our business clients, um, superannuation on your payroll, um, if you want to get a deduction in the FY22 year, superannuation actually needs to be paid. It's payment date is what drives the, the deduction for that. Um, remembering that if you late pay superannuation or you underpay superannuation and you're subject to super guaranteed um, charge, that those amounts are non-deductible. Um, we're recommending our business clients at the moment that if you are paying through a superannuation clearinghouse that you pay your June superannuation by the 15th of June. Now, I know that seems super early, but the funds actually have to clear into the superannuation funds um, bank account for you to get a deduction for that. And we, I think we all know that some of those superannuation clearing houses can take, you know, two to three or four business days to clear into their account and then pay into the superannuation account. So that's just probably us being um, a little bit more cautious. Um, if you are making personal superannuation contributions, say, for example, into your self-managed super fund or an industry fund where you are direct EFTing, we're probably talking a little bit extra time, but I would be looking to do it somewhere around the 20 to 23rd of June to, again, make sure that those funds have cleared into the um, superannuation bank accounts um, and you are getting the, you know, the benefit of that deduction. Um, Jackie, I got a question from a client the other day about you know, zero, for example, have sent out these things going, get your tax deduction, pay your super by 14th of June or whatever date they suggested. They they sort of chuck their hands up in the air and, oh, does that mean if I don't pay it by 14th of June, I don't get a tax deduction? It's, it's really about getting the deduction this year mm -hmm. because as long as that's still paid by the due date post 30th of June being, you know, 28th of 28th. July, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you'll get the deduction next year. It's Correct. just a, it's a timing thing. It's not a, if you don't pay it, it's no longer deductible. And, yeah. and I think sometimes that's a good thing to clarify. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you don't lose your deduction if you don't prepay at 30 June. You just have to make sure with superannuation that you do always pay it on time. And I think that warning around the clearing houses is, is probably relevant for... Um, you know, every quarter that you pay superannuation is, is that you probably do need to give yourself, um, you know, at least a good three to four business days of paying before the 28th to make sure that it clears. Because if it hasn't cleared into the bank account, then you are technically late and you could actually be technically um, up for super guarantee charge, which is not an ideal situation because, you know, those super guarantee charge rules are a nightmare and they're actually very draconian. So um, I think that's probably a good friendly reminder around superannuation. Um, and while we're talking super guarantee, I will just throw out a couple of few other friendly reminders because we are seeing a lot more compliance activity um, in relation to super guarantee. Um, so I think um, end of year or as you're doing sort of year-end payroll, it's a good refresher to go through and make sure that you do have superannuation calculating on all of your payroll categories that are considered ordinary time earnings. Um, and some key areas to probably have a look at are allowances um, and definitely bonuses. Um, so bonuses where um, unless they're paid 100% in respect of overtime are subject to super guarantee, they're considered ordinary time earnings. Um, things like travel allowances or motor vehicle allowances, you do have to have an expectation that the employee will fully expend those amounts in performing their duties so that it does have a business-related um, nature to them. So that's just some caution in that area. Um, I know we always talk about that overtime is not, not ordinary times earnings um, and it's not subject to superannuation, but I think... Um, you know, if working um, overshift hours or extra hours um, that, that you might have penalty rates on, but it is ordinary in terms of your industry or your, um, you know, your shift or your cycle, it could actually be subject to superannuation too. So I think I just always like to throw out a bit of a superannuation reminder. Um, and also the other reminder is that from 1 July, superannuation is going up to 10.5%. So we will see those progressive increases until um, super hits 12% 12, 12 in a couple of years. Um, so probably moving away from super guarantee um, and just talking about um, some of your personal and concessional contributions um, is uh, just talking about the maximum cap. So uh, it has increased from 25,000 to 27,000. 500, did I get that right for this year? <laughs> I always forget, it's 2,500. I think it is. Yeah. Sorry. I feel like they do it all the time and then I, um, you know, I can't remember all of these numbers. Um, 
So just a reminder also that if you haven't maxed out your um, non-concessional contributions um, in the last couple of years, but you actually can use your rolling balance cap um, and make a greater deduction. So, you know, um, not wanting to give any financial um, planning advice in respect of making personal super, superannuation contributions, but they can be quite effective, um, you know, if that's your financial plan to put your money into superannuation is like, you know, say, for example, you've got, you know, higher income this year, um, you've got a big capital gain coming through and you can use some of those rolling balance caps, um, but it is an efficient way to get an attack effective way to get money into superannuation. Um, a reminder that um, the bring forward rule for non-concessional contributions, so those are the contributions that you don't get a tax deduction for, um, is now up to 330 if you're under 67 and you haven't used the bring forward rule um, in the last three years. Um, but a reminder that your superannuation balance cap has to be less than 1.7 mil. Um, and I will just circle back in relation to that rolling balance cap is that your superannuation balance has to be less than 500,000 as well to use that measure. Um, and I guess my final reminder in relation to superannuation is um, that if you earn over 250,000, um, that you are subject to the additional 15% um, contributions tax. Um, so you will, once you launch tax return, if you're over 250 and you get that notice, you can release it from superannuation, but you do have to, um, fill out some specific forms in respect of that. Um, and just a reminder that it's adjusted taxable income. It's not your taxable income, it's taxable income plus things like super contributions and any um, investment losses that you have um, and reportable fringe benefits. So just, just a reminder in respect of that. Now, Rebecca, you can probably just recap on that because you know. <laughs> no, I actually move on from super and we'll come back to it at the okay, end. Cool. I've got a few questions about it as well. Cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to move on to, though, is we've had lots of rate changes in the last couple of years, both at the business level and the personal level. Craig, is there anything going on that our clients need to be aware of in regards to changing tax rates? Not immediately. So company rate is what it's going to be. Um, individual income rates will change, but that's not till the 2024 financial year. Um, so there's a little bit of time before that takes effect. Um, and that sort of effectively takes one of the middle um, bands of, of uh, income tax rates out and, and effectively gives everyone a bit of a, a, a tax cut that's, that's earning a higher, um, higher level of income. How we're kind of interacting with our clients on that basis is if they've got a company that they've got to ex uh, extract retained profits for from, I should say, um, or if they've got to pay some dividends out to me, um, Division 7A loans that borrowed money from the company in the past and haven't repaid it all. But bearing in mind that the, the tax rates are going to change in a couple of years, factoring that into the planning of what you have to pay now and what you have to pay in the future. So there's no sort of immediate um, benefit of a change in tax rates at this end of financial year. But it's certainly worth thinking about as you forward plan what your future um, extraction of funds from, from profitable companies particularly will look like. While we're talking about that, I'm actually going to change up our agenda slightly and talk <laughs> over to Jackie to talk about Div 7A, um, Division 7A and Director's Loans, Dividend Payments, because um, Craig led into that so nicely. <laughs> uh, Leave much in there. <laughs> Um, okay, so I think most of um, most of our listeners would be aware um, of what we call we we always talk about it as Division Seven A. That's because that's the section of the tax law that it relates to. But basically, what it means is that if you have a private company and you have loaned funds out of that company and you're a shareholder or an associate, remembering that associate is a very wide definition. Um, you have to meet um, minimum repayments over a seven-year period. They can be over 25 years, um, but those 25-year loans have to be secured over real property that's valued at more than 110%. So quite often we don't recommend 25-year loans unless you are drawing funds out of um, a company to, you know, to buy property purchase or something like that where you're going to have you know, income and deductions on the same side so that you're, so that you're matching that. Um, so basically, if you've drawn funds out of a private company um, on a loan, it's not coming out to you as a tax, like as a dividend and you're paying tax on it, 
you do have to meet your minimum requirements over a seven-year period, and that's that's interest and principal. Um, so quite often you either repay that by cash or you would have the company declare you a dividend and you would agree to offset the dividend payable against the loan that you already owe. Um, so um, just a reminder that those loans have to be documented. Um, you have to enter into agreement and it has to be a minimum interest rate, which is the benchmark interest rate. That is quite low at the moment because interest rates have been, um, you know, because it is benchmarked to, to the RBA rates. So it has been coming down over recent years. Um, and I guess the main thing I just wanted to talk about there is there is some recent changes where um, it's not just... Um, you know, if you're a shareholder, um, you know, an individual shareholder or a trust shareholder where you've drawn loan funds out, is that it can be that if you're trust, so if you've got a trust with business profits or investment profits and you're distributing those profits to a company and the company is paying tax, there are there has been recently rule changes in relation to those unpaid present entitlements being subject to these rules. Um, and we probably have been talking to you as our clients and as taxpayers for the last 12 years in relation to those rule changes. Um, we have been waiting um, from, you know, Treasury um, and the government to push through simplified Division 7A changes for a number of years. Those, those changes haven't progressed because obviously the government at the time have had more important things to be worrying about, i.e. COVID. Um, and so um, what the ATO have released is a ruling in relation to unpaid present entitlements, meaning that um, they now have to be placed on um, loan agreements only, um, like for seven-year loan agreements. You used to be able to put them under an investment agreement where you could just pay interest only and... Um, repay the balance at seven or ten years. <clears throat> um, so those those arrangements aren't going to continue from what, July 2022, um, and you may not get the additional time to put them on complying loan agreements where the trustee knows um, the value of that unpaid present entitlement at 30 June. So I think um, you know you'll hear us talking about that in tax planning meetings coming up. Um, so just a reminder around Division 7A. Thanks for that, Jackie. I'm going to um, circle back over now to talking a little bit more about tax planning for our entities and talking about the double whammy that can happen with uh, pay-as-you-go instalments lining up at the same time as income tax payments. Uh, we've done some manoeuvring with this for our clients to help with cash flow within allowable limits over the last couple of years. Craig, do you have anything to share with us about that? Yeah, it's, it's one of those, one of the great things the tax office did, um, the government did at the time, was allow companies to, to basically vary down or up to nil even um, quarterly instalments of income tax that they were paying based on historical years of, of lodged tax returns. And what, what we're now finding is that people are lodging tax returns, they've got big amounts of tax payable because they've come through the pandemic and they've remained profitable. Um, but when they have been paying, if they're paying, say, small instalments each quarter, you get a big liability when you lodge a, an income tax return. And if you're using the fixed instalment amount every quarter to, to determine what your company's quarterly instalment will be, um, once you lodge a tax return, let's say you lodge it on the due date of 15th of May, you crystallise a, a big tax liability. The next quarterly instalment of June looks to see well, what do we expect your annual tax that you would have to pay instalments to be, take away the three much smaller instalments that you've already made, and then there's a big balancing quarterly instalment to pay as well. And, and if that amount is, is appropriate for the profit you have made this financial year, it, it can often mean you're going very close to paying two years' worth of income tax in a, in a period of three months. So a lot of the stuff we're doing with our clients at the moment is when we're, we're sort of forecasting where 2022 income tax liabilities are likely to land, just estimates, but you know, understanding that once they're lodged, then that's going to result in probably some significant uplift in quarterly instalments and, and being aware of that and, and cash flowing for that as, as they move forward because, yeah, that, that ability to reduce instalments before or even if you haven't reduced them but you've just had leaner periods of trading during COVID and then afterwards have become profitable again, um, you, if you remain on the quarterly instalment regime, then there's, there's often a big catch-up mechanism that, that can hit quite late in the financial year. 
Thanks. That we're certainly starting to come along to this moment in time where everything we kick down the road is uh, starting to come <laughs> to fruition and items that we now have to deal with in business. Um, while I've got you, Craig, can you actually talk to us a little bit about some of the CGT implications of dis- of selling any of your assets for a variety of different reasons? But what should our clients um, be looking at in regards to shares, contract dates, discounts, and a whole range of other items? Um, so, I mean, shares, any any investments at the moment, particularly in real estate, we're seeing a lot of landlords that have had investment properties for a period of time. Values of property have gone up fairly significantly. It's a good time to, to cash out, get out of the investment. Um, one of the really important things to remember is that the, the date that is the driver of your capital gain and when that capital gain event takes place is the contract date. So around this time of year, a lot of people are signing contracts now, but settlement's going to be July or August next year. It's the contract date that will be the period of time that that transaction lands in. So understanding what that looks like um, in terms of the income that you're already earning this year and, and the impact that will be on the tax payable that you have to that you have to make once you lodge your tax returns is really important. For some people that are in the process of potentially selling real estate, you know, this is not financial advice clearly because markets can move around. Um, but thinking about whether you do actually want to sign a contract pre 30th of June or post 30th of June is, is fairly important. Um, shares is the same. Contract date is the date where, where um, your capital gains tax event takes place. If you've got a more broad um, share portfolio, some shares have been up, some shares have been down, talk to your financial advisor about whether there's potentially some opportunities to rebalance your portfolio maybe realise some capital losses on some shares which you can offset against some of the capital gains you've you've made. Um, being mindful of how capital gains tax discounts impact on that because if you typically if you hold a capital gain, an asset for longer than 12 months, a capital asset, you sell it, you will typically get a 50% discount if it's held in an individual name. Um, so you understand contract date versus contract date is that 12 month period. When you go to offset your cap- capital losses, if you realise some, it's against the gross capital gain before you apply that 50% discount. So as you're looking at how to, to do any of that rebalancing or, or um, uh, tax minimisation strategies, keep that in, in front of mind how that discount impacts. Um, another big sort of discount or, or, or concession that we are talking to a lot of people about is the small business capital gains tax concessions now this is a fit very complex area it's not a straight up and down thing so you know, if, if this is something that is going to land um, on you as a, as a client or, or as a business get some advice on this because there's a lot of traps that if you don't do it right you can get stung pretty badly um, if you, if there is going to be um, access to additional discounts under the small business capital gains tax concessions, putting money into superannuation through a retirement concession. There are some rules around making sure, particularly if there's trusts involved, that trust distributions are going to certain people in the right quantity. So absolutely talk to your advisor about that before um, end of financial year, because if there's a trust involved, you need to make a trust resolution before 30th of June. Um, and you need to make sure that that resolution is going to be in such a fashion that you will still retain access to those small business CGT concessions because the last thing you want to do is make a distribution that from an income tax point of view might marginally save you a little bit of tax but rules you right out of getting far more substantial discounts in, in the small business capital gains tax concession space. Thanks, Craig. And just to reiterate again, if you do have a complex tax matter or you're considering making changes to any of your portfolios and need financial advice, we have awesome tax accountants, financial planners at Business Depot. Best thing is it's all in-house. You can hit uh, both of your needs in one place. Um, Jackie, crypto, we've got people asking us, is it capital? Is it revenue? What am I doing? What can you talk to us about with crypto? Yeah, so I think uh, the important thing to remember here with crypto is, is it's kind of similar to, to share trading, really. Like if you're if you're holding um, cryptocurrency um, for long term capital growth, then you're going to be um, on CGT. Like you're going to be on capital accounts. Um, if you held it for more than twelve months, then it is discountable. Um, but if you're regularly trading currencies. Um, 
and you're more likely that, you know, you're doing sort of speculative trades all of the time, then you're likely going to be on revenue accounts. Um, I think the other thing to remember is, is that if you're settling any of your transactions in your business using crypto, which is becoming quite common now, um, is that someone might want to pay your services with crypto, um, is that you are going to be on revenue account on that too. So, um, And you, we are seeing um, where the ATO is heavily data matching in respect of crypto. So you quite often see those warnings coming up on clients, you know, ATO pre-fill reports saying, you know, this client has had trades in cryptocurrency. So just a reminder to keep all of your records um, because you it is taxable. Thanks, Jackie. And before we move on to looking at some trusts and some personal deductions, can you run us through quickly um, items that businesses need to be concerned about in regards to stock in the lead up to 30 June? Because stock take time, right? Yes, stock take time. So um, I think, you know, 30 June is always a good opportunity to review your stock lines, um, have a look at any obsolete or damaged stock and um, and make sure you are writing it off pre-30 June. Same as what we were talking about um, in respect of bad debts is that you can't just provision for obsolete stock. Um, you have to actually write it off. Um, so it's a good time of year to be, to be reviewing those stock lines and um, writing any of that off. Um, one of the concessions that small businesses, so um, with the extension to the definition of small business for these um, for the small business concessions, <coughs> sorry, is that if you've got a turnover of less than 50 million and you don't expect that your stock's going to move by more than 5k, you don't actually have to do a stock take. Um, this, this measure kind of always makes me laugh a little bit because particularly if you've got big lines of stock, how would you know if it's moved by more than 5K if you don't do a stock take? So um, I think it is just a reminder there that if you only have small lines and you do have a good level of understanding of <coughs> sorry, where your stock has moved, um, that you don't have to do a stock take, um, but I think best practice would be that you would do a stock take. Um, and a reminder that you can um, you know, measure your stock at the end of each year. Um, using different methods. And as Craig talked about earlier in the piece, um, you know, valuing stock and deciding whether you, you know, you include it at cost price, market selling or replacement value for tax really comes back to that matching income with expenses. Um, so the higher your value of, um, of stock uh, at year end, the higher your profit, the lower the value of your stock um, the you know the the lower your profit and it might just be working on that that if you you know you might want to have higher income this year um, you know for whatever reason um, but you know in other years you might want to have lower income because you're expecting higher income the next year so you want to match that you know the stock with where the income's sitting I think it's always just important to have a look at your stock have a look at the value that you're using for tax and make that decision. Thanks, Jackie. And before we end on um, trust distributions, I'm actually going to throw to you, Craig, to talk us through what our <coughs> individual clients need to know in regards to claiming personal deductions for 2022. Well, the first tip, um, make sure you keep some records. That's that's always the first thing. Always makes the first our job thing. easier. Yeah, yeah, it makes our job easier. But also, if you ever happen to be reviewed, it makes getting through the review far easier if you've got receipts because, you know, if you don't have any document, documentation to, to back up um, your deduction claim, then the ATO are well within their rights to disallow the deduction entirely. So um, what are some of the things to, to really um, keep an eye out for? Um, making sure that where you are spending money on anything work-related, as I said, keeping the receipts, but making sure it is work-related. Um, making sure with your income protection, if you have income protection, that you're getting the statement of tax deductibility. Some people have some sort of mixed insurance policies there. There might be a life component and an income protection component. So make sure you're only claiming for the proportion of uh, your premiums that are related to income protection. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, ATO focus recently around cars um, and you know, there's you know, the two methods that you can use to claim a, a car tax deduction, the cents per kilometre up to a maximum of 5,000 kilometres. Records will be needed to support that. But then there's an operating cost method, which is basically your business use times by all, your, all of your costs. And, and what's the thing, the very first thing that the tax office will ask for if you get looked at for your business use will be your logbook. 
So absolutely imperative. And with the data matching the ATO has now, whether it be business or individual, is, you know, cars are an easy focus for them. So make sure you've got your logbook, make sure you've got all your key things in there. Um, it needs to be less than five years old and but still represent the current pattern of usage. So if it's if it's still within five years old, but the reality is you've just decided to work from home and you never get in your car, then your pattern of use has just changed and you need to do an updated logbook. Um, odometer readings, keeping a track of each each trip, those kind of things are really important. Um, and yeah, the you know, which we've seen before, the ATO, if, it, if a logbook's not right, they can they can deny the deduction. So that, that for some people, particularly uh, a lot of my real estate clients, car expenses, they live in their car and on their phone. Um, so it's a big deduction. If you don't get it right, you miss out. Um, so so getting that logbook is, is really critical. Um, keeping track of your home office expenses, um, making sure that you where you've got some claims against some of your home office expenses, that you're keeping some kind of register of the hours that you're working from home. That's that's really critical. Um, making sure when you're making donations that you've got tax or <coughs> receipts for them. Um, little dip of the lid to, to my real estate clients. You know, if you are a commission only em employee of, of an agency and you are giving things like settlement gifts and those kind of things, you know, they, these can add up really quickly. So make sure you're keeping keeping records and, and appropriate documents. Very handy if if you you know you bought two um, two big magnums of Maui that you've got the property details on who the vendor was and who the purchaser was that you gave those um, those two and, and keep all of those together. Um, another one that and I think it was briefly touched on before, just talking about the maximum personal deductible limit of, of superannuation, making sure with your superannuation fund, whether that's a self-managed super fund or an industry retail fund, that if you're punching some money into the super fund getting the notice of intention to claim um, that deduction is really important. Um, if you don't have that, then you don't have the supporting documents to, to back up a, a tax deduction claim. Some funds, my fund, for example, it has a different BSB if you put in a personal deductible contribution and then they'll send you out something saying, do you want to claim this? And you have to follow that through. So it's not just chuck the money in, set and forget. You often have to actually take some proactive action on that. Thanks for that, Craig. And we've actually seen the ATO disallow deductions if the super funds do not um, say that they've received a notice of intent to claim. So make sure you follow that proper procedure if you're making personal contributions to your superannuation fund and intend to claim them for tax purposes. And as um, Craig was talking about all of our fantastic real estate deduction tips, we're updating the top tax tactics for real estate agents. So please keep an eye out on our website and our blog uh, for the latest for least, which will be ready shortly. Now we're going to wrap up pretty soon, but first of all, we're going to delve into trust, which has gotten lots and lots of um, airspace lately because there's been some huge change <coughs> and you know, is looking very closely, um, particularly discretionary trust. Jackie, what does everyone need to know in the lead up to 30 June? You know, Rebecca, I know you purposefully left, left this to last so that if I do just go on and on about my favourite topic that you'll just wrap me up, like, really quickly. So, yeah, that was that was the ploy to leave this till last. Um, the trusts have had a lot of airplay um, for the last number of years. Um, you know, the ATO don't particularly like them. You know, they see that they're an area where there can be high egregious schemes in terms of, you know, tax avoidance and tax you know, minimisation. So it has seen an area, like a lot of area of focus. Um, you know, as a tax nerd and tax practitioners, we have been pushing, um, you know, as industry groups to see a lot of reform in, in respect of trust taxation that just realistically hasn't been forthcoming. And I guess that probably has, you know, I think, you know, my personal opinion is, is the ATO probably want that reform too. Um, because they haven't seen that reform, they've started to issue a lot of tax rulings, taxpayer alerts, um, practice statements in respect of trusts and trust distributions. Um, now, as we are aware, um, unless trustees want to pay tax at top marginal tax rates, they do need to um, distribute income to eligible beneficiaries prior to 30 June. Um, now, look, some trustees do allow you to make, um, you know, oral declarations in respect of distribution of income, but coming back to Craig's point is as if you're in an ATO review, um, 
you know, you need that evidence of, of who the trustee distributed to. Um, so that's why we always recommend making sure that you document your trust distribution resolutions and minutes prior to 30 June. You have a meeting, you document it, you sign the minutes so that there's no argument um, over who was presently entitled to that income at 30 June. Um, otherwise, you know, it could be a default beneficiary, um, which might not be ideal. Um, or it could be, um, you know, the trustee paying tax at top marginal tax rate. Um, just a reminder that if you've got um, eligible beneficiaries in your trust and their children under 18, that the limit um, of taxable income that they can earn um, is $416, so not a great amount. Anything over that, like you can give them more if you want, but anything over that is going to be paying tax at top marginal tax rates. So certainly not tax efficient. So just, just a remember, reminder, um, you know, not to be giving large distributions to children under 18. Um, now I am going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, reimbursement agreements. This has had a lot of airplay in the media at the moment. Um, it's a huge area of focus for the ATO. Um, and so you'll hear us as tax, tax practitioners throw around, you know, 100A, Section 100A reimbursement agreements. You know, what is it? What does it mean? You know, um, it's, it's kind of, you know, most people, average people out there, so, you know, that don't deal in tax say, you know, we don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> but basically, um, you know, Section, Section 100A will apply where you have a present entitlement for a trust and it arises out of a reimbursement agreement. So if I give you a fairly egregious example here, um, you know, Craig has a stack of capital losses from some bad investments that he's previously made. Um, I've got a large family, um, I've got a large capital gain in my trust. Um, and I agree with Craig to distribute that capital gain to him. He's going to offset his capital losses, um, you know, reduces the tax payable on that distribution. I pay the tax for Craig, you know, because he's, you know, he's worn some tax on my large capital gain out of my trust. Um, and then we agree that he's just going to gift that present entitlement back to me um, and I give him a kickback for agreeing to do that. That's, that's kind of the most egregious form of probably what the whole purpose of 100A was designed to do. Um, but I think the key here is, is that it, it can also apply to your normal ordinary family distributions and ordinary family dealings. And that's where the ATO is trying to provide some guidelines and, you know, give us as tax practitioners and taxpayers some guidelines as to what they think is going to fall in with 100A and what's not going to. So I think the biggest question here that we're going to see from clients, and you're going to hear us talking about this, you know, in the next few years and leading into tax planning this year is, can I still distribute to my adult children? And I think the answer to that is yes, but comes with the same caveats always come from. Distributing income to the trust, if the trustee makes your adult children presently entitled, they have a fixed and indefeasible right to that present entitlement. So effectively, you've got to pay them the cash. So if you don't want your adult kids to have that cash at the end of the day, don't have the trust, you know, trustees don't make the decision to give them that money. Um, so I think, you know, I think that's my key key warning there. Um, and I think the other thing is, is that, you know, what if, what if the trust, um, you know, pays um, so that the adult children have that present entitlement that, you know, the trust owes them 180000 for giving them that present entitlement. And, the trust pays some of the, the kids' expenses, like maybe they've paid their tax, maybe they've paid for their overseas holiday, maybe they've paid for their university fees or their new car or a house deposit. You know, can you offset those two entitlements? Um, and I think my warning there and the practical warning there is, is, look, you can do those things, but make sure you have the documentation. Make sure the adult children are aware that they're getting a distribution. Make sure they're aware of how much present entitlement they're owed to. Um, you know, if the trust has paid expenses on their behalf, make sure that the adult children have, you know, agreed to it, it's in writing and, you know, and, and everyone's happy with that and it is formally, formally documented because whilst, you know, there's a lot of commentary around, you know, well, okay, it's an ordinary family dealing and it shouldn't, you know, it, it should be... Um, you know, that, that families do share wealth, that, that 
you know, it shouldn't be subject to 100A. This is an area of focus of the ATO and if you don't want to, you know, end up in front of, you know, the commissioner arguing your case, I think it's just caution is probably needed now until we've got some clearer guidelines. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty much all I want to say on 100A unless you want me to keep going. <laughs> no, that's enough. Thanks, Jackie. If anyone needs any more information on 100A or anything else we've talked about, please reach out to us. Don't hesitate. That's why we're here. Craig, your last piece of advice for anybody who's joined us today? Oh, can I have two? Sure. Great. Excellent. First one, really simple one, very unsexy, but just make sure you've got all your records. Like that's so important. Paper trail. Um, and when I think about the, the characteristics of a lot of my real estate clients is cars are a big tax deduction. Make sure you've got log books. I can't stress that enough. Um, and the other one is just making sure you're looking at your timing of, of your expenses and, and revenue and and where you're effectively bringing forward the recognition of an expense, make sure you've got some kind of documentation to back it up. So kind of kind of two, kind of one. It's all about documentation. Thanks, Craig and Jackie. Um, oh, trust distributions, just make sure they're documented. Um, and if you've got unpaid present entitlements to adult children, don't do magic journal entries because 100A will be the least of your worries. Um, yeah, that's probably, that's probably my recommendation. Thank you both so much and thank you everybody for joining us. This webinar will be up on our blog later today and last reminder, businessdepot.com.au if you need to contact us for anything. Thank you. Thanks, guys.